Lone Wolf and Cub, Baby Cart in Peril. It's a fourth out of six films in the Lone Wolf and Cub series. And this one actually comes pretty directly out of one of the stories from Kazuo Koike's manga. In case you don't know the story so far, it follows the former Shogun's executioner who was framed by the Yagu clan, and now he travels Japan with his young son Daiguru. He works as a freelance assassin along his demon's path toward vengeance and damnation. He usually ends up doing something very honorable that seems a little more like redemption, but he never sees it that way. He sees himself as evil and just beyond redeeming himself. So what's pretty incredible is the first four films in the series were all released in Japan in the same year, 1972. The very first one came out January 15th, and this one came out December 30th. That must have been one hell of a year in Japanese cinema. They also had two female convict scorpion movies, Godzilla vs. Gigan, Hanzo the Razor, which I heard a lot about, two Zatoichi films, and we also got Street Mobster and Under the Flag of the Rising. One hell of a year. I will say, Japanese directors really got their shit done back then. So, this was also the first Lone Wolf and Cub film not directed by Kenji Masumi. He did the first three films in the series, he also did Hanzo the Razor, and he did that all in one year. And I guess it was too much for him to do a fifth film in that same year, that would have been insane. So, in this film, it's directed by Buichi Saito, which I don't really know anything about. I haven't really seen any of his films yet. This was his third film in 1972, released after two Yakuza films. So, this film is kind of broken up into two plot lines. One of them involves a badass Oyuki, played by Michi Azuma. What's kind of cool is she actually played a different character in the previous film, Baby Cart at the River Styx. In this film, she plays a former sword mistress that's gone rogue, just so that she could get revenge on her former teacher that did something horrible to her. Also, she's pretty much topless this whole film. Something only Japanese films could get away with. Actually, one of her trademarks is to flash her chest at someone and then just strike them when they're distracted. It's kind of cheap. She then chops off their top knots, which in their culture seem to be more humiliating than death itself. She's sort of like a Brutus the Barber Beefcake. He was a wrestler that used to badly shave the heads of those that he defeated in the ring. I wanna see this on YouTube. It's good. So getting back to the story, Ogami is then hired to kill Oyuki. And it sort of becomes a detective story as he tries to find her just by listening to stories about her from various people that have met with her. And this part of the film kind of turns into a detective story, just as he tries to find more information, listening to stories from her from various people that met up with her. Eventually, he tracks her down. While he's hanging out in a hot spring, he watches her kill some guys and just listens to her story. And like with the audience, he eventually sides with her. The other plotline in the film is about a wandering samurai who turns out to be Gunbei Yagyu. And he's played by Yoichi Hayashi, who was also in the film quite on. So this is a character that Ogami knew from his past. He's supposed to be dead, and he was a rival for the executioner post. Gunbei actually won the duel to get the job, but during the fight, he mistakenly pointed his sword in the direction of the Shogun. And Ogami put himself in front of the blade to protect the Lord. And because of this, they end up giving the job to Ogami. Gunbei and his entire clan are disgraced by this event, and they decided to get even by framing Ogami for a murder. And 
this actually ties in to the plot of the first film. So this film ends up feeling the most like a sequel to the original because of this. And I'd say that this was an overall very solid entry. I actually like this one more than the previous film, which was also good, but it had a very slow middle part. This film just has tons of cool fighting gimmicks. There's ninjas disguised as Buddhist statues. There's this awesome flaming sword. But really, that's just the icing on the cake. Actually, the very first five minutes of the film begin with a fight, and it's a pretty badass one too, but it's not with Ogami for once. It's with the new girl, Oyuki. Ogami does still get some great fights in it though, especially the duel in the beginning. This is where he faces off with Gunbei, chops off his arm, and Ogami just delivers the greatest line ever. <laughs> The little kid, that girl, also gets to do the most in this film than all the other ones I've seen so far. And it's this film that we learn just how awesome this kid is. There's this one part where Goombay puts his sword in the kid's face, but the girl doesn't flinch at all. He just kind of rolls his eyes. Goombay then swears that this kid has the deaf life eyes, and he can't believe it. He says that the eyes belong only to those who have survived death and carnage multiple times. So he then follows that guru and he watches him. When the kid accidentally gets trapped in the middle of the field that's being burned, Goombay's suspicions are confirmed. Goombay stands there and just watches curiously. But of course, this is that guru we're talking about, not some chump. So he buries himself in the dirt, and he survives the fire. I will say, there definitely is some weird things throughout the film that I think didn't really translate that well from manga to movie. This is part where they fake Gumei's death, and they do this by summoning this character named Garoza, the Kurokawa Facemaker. He's this master of the skies who for some reason is able to create prosthetic face molds, sort of like they do in movies. So he makes his face and he makes himself look like Goombay, and then he willingly gets decapitated. I feel like none of that really seems believable, in fact it seems kind of stupid. I also felt that the two storylines in the film don't really have anything to do with each other. It ends up feeling like there's just two different chapters from the manga that were both put into the film. I also found some parts of the film to be a little slow, especially in the middle. But luckily, there's a lot of great action in the beginning and ending of the film, so it kind of balances it out. I just would have liked a little bit more of a better pacing. Overall, I'm gonna say though that this is a very solid entry, and I just really like this series a lot, so I'm looking forward to the next two films. So if you've managed to watch this much of the video, I just want to say thank you and please subscribe. And if you'd like to help out the channel, please check out my Patreon. Once again, thanks for watching.